Mark, I'd like to uh, reconvene the um, Ways and Means uh, Committee. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, next bill up is uh, Representative Nelson's uh, Omnibus State Government uh, Finance Bill. And uh, this is the one then, uh, when we're done with the presentation, that we'll be uh, moving uh, Representative Eklund's uh, bill in as an article um, in this uh, bill at the appropriate time. So, uh, Representative Nelson, uh, if you're uh, prepared, and uh, I should acknowledge while I'm thinking of it, I'm not sure if there'll be questions of her, but uh, Julie uh, Blaha, the uh, state auditor, I think is here somewhere. Around the corner? Okay. I'll, um, I think the provision that uh, the state auditor was mainly interested in will be resolved with an amendment, but uh, she is available if need be. Uh, Representative Nelson, if you'd care to make a motion. Mr. Chair and members, I'll move the adoption of the State Government Finance Division Report for House File 1935. Mr. Okay, Chair. The uh, motion is before us. And I would, Representative as of Nelson. yesterday, I would also ask for a roll call on that. Okay, roll call has been uh, requested. <coughs> Uh, any discussion? Let me know when you're ready. You're all set? Okay, the clerk will take the roll. Uh, Representative Carlson? Aye. Representative Olson? Representative Garofalo? No. Representative Albright? No. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Representative Davids? Representative Dabney. Uh, Representative Driskowski. No. <coughs> Representative Eklund. Aye. Representative Hamilton. <coughs> yeah. Representative Hansen. Aye. Representative Hausman. Yes. Representative Hertos. Um, Representative Hornstein. Yes. Representative Krisha. Representative Liebling? Aye. Representative Lilly? Representative Long? Yes. Representative Mariani? Yes. Representative Marquardt? Yes. Representative Nelson? Yes. Representative Noor? Yes. Representative Pulowski? Um, Representative Poppy? Yes. Representative Schumacher? No. Representative Scott? Nope. Representative Torkelson? Representative Vogel? No. Representative Wagenius? Yes. Okay, being uh, 14 uh, uh, yeses and 7 uh, noes, the motion prevails. Uh, Representative Nelson, can I make another motion? Mr. Chair, I move that House File 1935 as amended be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the uh, motion is before us. Now, uh, there are some amendments. Would you like to take the amendments now to get the bill in the order that you'd like? Yes, Mr. Chair. I'll, I have the A54 amendment. And Mr. Chair and members, when we were in committee and we took up amendments, uh, there were some of them that we accepted, but as we were talking about these, and we, I said it multiple times in committee that if we find out at, after we get the bill done that night, if there's cost to them, or issues with them, we will uh, have an amendment to take them back out in committee. And this amendment encompasses two amendments we had in committee. The one being the A10 amendment, which is the one that actually had costs, and I think that's the one you referenced uh, the auditor about. And it's dealing with campaigning, campaigning laws and how when we're in the legislature, when we go signy die 60 days after that, we have to stop mass uh, communications from the, from the from the Capitol because it <coughs> interferes with campaigning. And the, the amendment was to make the constitutional officers on the same track as the House, which in one way was problematic because they have four-year terms. Um, but the issue that came up with this is the Secretary of State, part of their job is, whoever is in that position, is to promote the elections, promote keep people getting out and voting, and this would have eliminated or pro prohibited him, the Secretary of State, from being able to do that. Also, there are communications that go off from the auditor's office. Also, it was raised that 
every state website has a picture of the governor's on it. And so if the governor's on that, on that, the cost of having to take the governor's picture and pictures of them promoting the, the deer hunting opener, which was, falls right in that time frame, those type of things would have to cease. So, and that would be a, a huge cost. And then after the election, they'd have to be put back on. So that's what that part, portion of it does. The other piece had to do with a solar and solar panels that are being installed or have to be, when they do the uh, architectural work and the, the planning work for building new buildings or remodeling buildings that the state owns, that solar and, or, or uh, renewable energy has to be considered as part of that. Um, in the bill, there was a cap that was on there of 350 kilowatts that's being removed. And there was some concern that, well, if we generate a lot of electricity, we're going to be dumping this back on and having to sell and selling it back to the, to the uh, grid. And, that, and then we shouldn't be making money and shouldn't be keep competing with our utility companies. Uh, the, we, the reason that this is problematic is we, buildings that we bond either have used bond funds to build or remodel. If we were to sell, make money off of those buildings by selling this energy back to the local municipalities would make those, put those bonds in jeopardy and they would lose their tax exempt status, which would have a whole other ramifications. So we're taking those two pieces back out. Okay, so the uh, motion is before us uh, to adopt the A54 amendment. Any discussion? Mr. Chair. Representative Albright. Mr. Chair, um, just so I don't forget it, I would request a roll call on the amendment itself, the A54. <coughs> roll call has been uh, requested. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair, and Representative Nelson, we've had some conversations about this. Uh, while I uh, understand the, um, the rationale per se with removal of both of those amendments that we just did in the markup here a couple days ago, um, I would have hoped uh, that we've had a little more time to understand the costing on those. Uh, we didn't talk about those in terms of identifying costs on those. Um, I'm sure other members uh, um, are wondering about those, and so I'll just leave my comments uh, with that uh, uh, pursuant to just to wrap up, Mr. Chair. Representative Grapple. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Nelson, uh, obviously I'm opposed to this amendment. Um, I'm confused why you're making your members vote on this as opposed to just taking care of it in conference committee, but regardless, I would ask members to vote no on this bill, or vote no on this, uh, your amendment. Well, Mr. Chair, members, the reason we're, we're taking these out is because it would put our bill over the target we have, and therefore we, we'd be violation of the budget for, or the budget resolution. So that's, that's why we're taking them out. And that's why I said it in committee that if we find out that they add to the cost of the bill, we have to take them back out. And uh, one of the things is that, that we try to get the bills in the best form possible, and uh, this is the last stop for the House floor. So. Uh, but uh, one crucial point is uh, we do have to make sure they are within their target. Uh, any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, was there a fiscal note on that portion that we're deleting from the bill? Uh, there wasn't. Not on the amendment, no. Okay, any uh, further uh, questions or discussions? Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Nelson, can you tell us where the expenses are in these amendments that uh, <coughs> requires you to adhere by what you uh, promised the members in committee? Mr. Mr. Chair, members, I, I did in, in my description. I did on the the solar piece. That's not so much an, a, a, a cost to the uh, currently in, or a cost to the uh, the bill, mm -hmm. but that has to do with, with affecting our bonds and our bond ratings and the ability to, to sell those as tax-free bonds if we're making money off of buildings that we own. And that's why that's why that's why that we're taking that one out. That's, we, don't, we don't want to <coughs> affect that piece of it. But in the solar piece, or excuse me, in the election piece that we described, it's the cost of having to re reprogram all the websites of the state 60 days after we go sunny die every four years and um, actually it's every two years is the way the bill, the, the bill, the amendment read. So every two years we'd have to take, reprogram all the websites, taking the governor's, on the governor's websites, the governor's stuff off, the auditor's website, the, the auditor's information off them, and then after the election putting them back on. So that's the cost that's in there and that, there were some projections that, um, I didn't get firm numbers, but there's some projections on that that were given to us and it, again, would have put the bill out of, out of, uh, out of our target. 
Any further discussion? Representative Scott? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Um, I, we don't see any paperwork affirming this. Uh, those seem to be uh, far grass for, uh, for legitimacy to taking out of the bill. Um, it seems to be more, I, I'm not fully familiar with these provisions, but it seems to be a political decision rather than a fiscal one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any further uh, discussion on the amendment? Uh, seeing none, then um, the clerk will uh, take uh, the roll on the amendment, the A54. Representative Carlson? Aye. Representative Olson? Aye. Representative Garuffalo? No. Representative Albright? No. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Representative Davids? Representative Dabney? Aye. Representative Jeskowski? No. Representative Eklund? Aye. Representative Hamilton? <coughs> Representative Hansen? Aye. Representative Hausman? Yes. Representative Hertoss? Representative Hornstein? Yes. Representative Kresha? No. Representative Liebling? Yes. Representative Lilly? Yes. Representative Long? Yes. Representative Mariani? Aye. <coughs> Representative Marquardt? Yes. Representative Nelson? No. No, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Confused. Yeah, I was looking at the bill. Sorry. Yes. Um, Representative Noor? Yes. <laughs> Representative Pulowski? Yes. Representative Poppy? Yes. Representative Schumacher? No. Representative Scott? No. Representative Torkelson? No. Um, Representative Vogel? No. Representative Wigginius? Yes. Okay, being 18 ayes and seven uh, noes, uh, motion uh, passes, or the amendment passes. Um, Representative Nelson on the bill. Mr. Chair, members, there's basically six articles in the bill. The for our first article has to do with state government appropriations, and I believe you have this in your packet. Um, appropriations, so all the constitutional officers, uh, appropriations to the, to the legislature, our budget, um, which is part of this, and uh, the, HAVA, the HAVA, and there's some professional technical services contract piece in there. Uh, the second one has to do with state government operations. There's some cleanup language here. The biggest part of this is, um, and we slimmed it down from what, was, what it was in the actual bill, but the House file 1962, which deal, not that's the House file, 1962, um, get the right number, anyway, it was a House file that had to deal with changing Warrants, which, which is all throughout state statute, dealing how we pay uh, outside people and changing it to payment. It's an warrant is an old term, and they that goes through the whole thing. Um, we're extending the Legislative Data Practices Commission um, and just other other uh, things, other government operation issues that go throughout the bill. Um, in the uh, the. I'll get my, go down by the articles here. We also have the elections article in here, which is the uh, um, article four, which is the elections and voting right article, House File 1603 from the Elections Committee got rolled into this. And then there's a, um, that's article four. Article three was the payment technology piece. Article five is the campaign finance issues, um, basically the cleanup language for the campaign finance board. And then article six is the redistricting piece. And, and that's the basic of the bill. Okay, and is there any discussion then on the bill? Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Chair Nelson, thank you for uh, uh, operating an efficient uh, committee this session. I appreciated working with you on this bill. And members, uh, this bill is not so much about what it does do, but what it doesn't do. And I'll just draw your attention to uh, articles, uh, particularly Article 4. Uh, as well as, uh, to some extent, five and six. But there has been a precedent over the three administrations just passed uh, where there has never been uh, an elections uh, change that has not uh, been supported with strong bipartisan uh, support. This is where we deviate from that with this bill. We also deviate it in the function that it also has never been inserted into another bill at all. My uh, recollections uh, has been a standalone bill that has uh, journeyed it by itself. 
and that is not the case uh, in this bill as well. So while it's unfortunate that um, we have to, in a sense, have uh, this tucked into the House uh, State Government Finance Bill, I think it does a disservice to the uh, greater public because now they don't understand what elections are going to be like because we'll be debating uh, a state government finance bill with that tucked in. It's very unfortunate that we are not observing uh, what other administrations have done, uh, along with both uh, members from uh, both chambers in terms of support of election uh, reform measures or election adjustment measures. Uh, and for that, uh, members uh, and as well as other issues with the bill relevant to the other articles, I will not be supporting this bill, and I hope that uh, uh, members will also take that into consideration. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Nelson, did you say the HAVA funding is in this bill? I thought there was a conference committee for that. Representative Nelson. Mr. Chair, members, if you remember uh, our discussions on the floor of the HAVA bill, House File 14, um, it was stated there was uh, many amendments to try and put the $163,000 that the Secretary of State needs to, to access the full $6.5 million. And as I said in that on the floor, that funding would be in the state government finance bill. And that's the funding that's in here. Plus how the, all the House File 14 is in here, but, it's, but that funding, the $163,000 that is needed to access the remainder of the money is in this bill. And that's what I said on the floor. Mr. Chairman and Representative Nelson, I, I'm sure that conference committee is going to be wrapping up in just a day or so here. Too. Right. It sounds like things are going pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Everything's going well. So, um, uh, One last question before I get my closing statement. So the Legislative Budget Office, I actually thought that there was bipartisan consensus on this, and it seems to be that the House majority has opposition to this. Can you just expound on where that opposition comes from? And, I mean, as a legislative branch, I think this is something that we're in favor of. Nelson. Mr. Chair and members, and that's, I, that's, I probably should have pointed that out, but the Legislative Budget Office is in here where I'm eliminating it in my bill, um, partly because of the current Legislative Budget Office has at least six employees, able, I think they have five on uh, working now, but they, they have the, do six. They're asking to double the size of their operation. They're saying... They can't do what they're supposed to do with the people they have on, so they wanted a huge increase. Um, this is plus when they're doing this money, they're still going to have to go to the to the management Minnesota management and budget to get the information they need to make the to make the fiscal notes. So the, what this, my bill does is it eliminates the legislative budget office and leaves that function where it is in the in the management and budget. Um, in management and budget, when when we're in session, they move people from other duties. Into that, I believe the number I was told was 19 right now are working on our fiscal notes. When we're not in session, they move those people back to do other duties. The Legislative Budget Office, their only job would be to provide our fiscal notes for us, which would be the five months of the year that we're here in session, the two, two and a half months, three months that we are in the off year. The rest of the time, they would have no job to do. And so we'd have, we'd have state employees without assigned tasks to be done. And therefore, I thought that was a waste, wasteful spending of our taxpayer dollars. And the conservative side of me that some people may not believe is there, but the conservative <laughs> cheap sweet in me, I would say, um, thinks that's a wasteful spending of state dollars. Um, Mr. Chairman, Representative, Rob, uh, Representative Nelson, uh, in the Senate bill, it looks like they take the carry forward of the House of Representatives and uh, use it for spending and other purposes. How are how are we as the House retaliating against the Senate to uh, offset that egregious policy? Mr. Chair and Representative Garofalo, um, that'll be a discussion in, in, in conference, but I've tried to be better than the, than the Senate and not do that, not go after them. I left their budget, their budget number the way it was. Um, there's, an increase, there's an increase in here for the state or for the House budget, um, but there is, you know, they didn't give us a number to put in that they needed for more money and so I but I didn't feel it was my place to go after them and, and take their money for other purposes like unlike what they did was trying to take our money which is uh, currently funding our salaries and our staff salaries and that budget that um, the current way the current budget that we have we're actually <coughs> underfunding what we're spending and we're, we're running deficit in the state in the House of Representatives. Well, Mr. Chairman and Representative Nelson uh, as one House member to another, I can just tell you that I, uh, I feel your pain. 
<laughs> and I, I see where the, the sessions go on. I, I've, I've been where you're about to be going. So uh, I do wish you the best of luck and hope that everything ends up okay. Um, <laughs> In addition to that, the chair of this committee has also been there. <laughs> In the end, uh, we uh, kind of accept the uh, budget of the other body and they accept ours. Uh, it's um, unfortunate, I guess, that a game is being played right now, but uh, at oh. any rate, uh, hopefully it'll work out in the end for both bodies. So, Mr. Chairman, just in closing, uh, just on the fiscal matters, this bill, uh, this is a 12% increase above the current base budget. Uh, this is financed primarily by tax increases and it is growing government at an unsustainable level that is growing faster than the pers personal income of the private sector of the state. Uh, for that reason, I would ask members to vote no and I wish you good luck, Mr. Representative Wilson. <laughs> and by the way, uh, just to follow up on my earlier comments, uh, the last time we had difficulty with the Senate and how it elected, <coughs> we were one of the conferees and the problem came out of the governor's office and uh, in the end we worked it out uh, but um, I won't say which governor you probably mm -hmm. remember. Um, at any rate, uh, any further discussion on the uh, bill? Uh, seeing none, um, this is uh, one of the bills where we're going to uh, have uh, some motions to uh, combine, uh, in this case, the uh, veterans bill. So Representative Nelson, would you like to move the language contained in House file 1935 as amended be included as separate articles in the Omnibus State Government and Veterans Affairs Bill. Yes, I do. Okay, the um, motion is uh, before us. Um, you, are the, you are now the chair. And uh, Representative, uh, oh, excuse me, we need to vote then. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carried. I was getting a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, Representative Eklund. Um, would you like to move to incorporate the language contained in House File 2086 as amended into House File 1935 as separate article? I so move, Mr. Okay, Chair. The motion is uh, before us. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion carried. Uh, Representative Nelson uh, then renews his motion that House File 1935, <laughs> as amended, be recommended to be placed on the General Register and that staff be directed to make any technical corrections and amend the title. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion carried. I do. Um, with that, uh, we'll now go to... Uh, the next bill on the agenda, which is thank you, members, and, and I, and pray for me in conference. <laughs> uh, House File uh, 2195, Represent Mark Court, uh, the Omnibus Tax Bill, or 2125. What did I say? Oh, okay, didn't have my glasses on. House File 2125, Represent Mark Court, the Omnibus Tax Bill. Uh, Representative Mark Court will give you a second to get settled. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I move that House File 2125, first and engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us, and we do have uh, some amendments. Uh, Representative Marquardt, the uh, A21. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the A21 amendment. And members, this is a cleanup from the, the tax committee's work. Uh, it does uh, about seven things, um, clarifies a change in the dependent exemption subtraction, uh, corrects some effective dates for the historic structure credit, uh, deletes sections related to calculating the net interest deduction limit for insurance companies. Uh, Representative Grossel uh, requests to change the intent statement for the Baudet Ice Arena construction exemption. Uh, deals with a technical correction relating to the solid waste taxes in Hennepin and Ramsey counties. Uh, clarifies language for bonds backed by county transportation sales tax. And on a uh, David's amendment yesterday dealing with the Duluth Regional Exchange District board, it um, changes the expiration date to 25 years after it start rather than tying it to appropriation bonds, which were not part of the David's amendment. So uh, members that is the amendment. Okay, any discussion on the amendment? 
Uh, seeing none then, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Uh, Representative Marquardt, the A22 amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I move the A22 amendment. And members, this is uh, very, very technical in nature. Okay, any uh, discussion well, on the amendment? Mm -hmm. Seeing none then, all Let's those in favor signify amendment. by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Representative Marquardt, would you care to present the bill? I would, and thank you very much. And before I present the tax bill, just a real quick thanks to the great staff that help in putting all this uh, together. I know all of these bills, but it's quite a lot of work for staff. So I want to first of all thank the staff for all the work and all the members of the tax committee that helped put this bill together. Members, House File 2125, the tax bill, is really uh, about creating a great future for the state of Minnesota. And what this bill does, it provides the foundation for the investments that we're going to need to improve the quality of life for every resident in the state and to grow our economy into the future. Members, we have a future deficit. The next biennium, we have a deficit, which means we cannot raise one ongoing dollar and that be in education or nursing homes or local government aid or whatever uh, without creating some revenue into the future. You just cannot make those investments. And that's what this bill does. It's, it allows for an historic investment in E through 12 education Basically. that will help uh, get us to creating the world's best workforce. It makes an investment that allows us to freeze tuition in our college systems for two years. It allows for investment that's going to make it so that everyone can have accessible and affordable health care. It's going to make it so that our communities are strong and safe and are prospering. It's going to do those things and really focus on improving the quality of life for people around the state. So how do we get there with this tax bill? The way we get there is by um, creating more fairness into the tax code and leveling the playing field for our working families and our senior citizens, <coughs> our farmers and our small businesses. And one of the main ways we do this, and we can talk about this later, is bringing back dollars right now that foreign corporations are sheltering uh, through gimmicks and tax avoidance in tax havens. And we're going to bring those dollars back to Minnesota. And that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, these tax havens, it's what big corporations are doing is perfectly legal, but it's not right. And it's not right because when companies are able to shelter dollars in Bermuda Islands or the Cayman Islands and not bring them back here to Minnesota, it means that other businesses that don't have foreign operations are at a disadvantage and pay more in taxes, and all of us pay more in taxes, and makes it more difficult to invest in education and health care and public safety. And finally, this bill is real tax reform. Probably the highlight in that is that we match up the standard deduction with the federal standard deduction of 24,400, uh, which means that about 92% of all Minnesotans, if this was to become law, would now be uh, a standard deductor rather than an itemizer, which means it's going to make it a lot simpler and a lot easier for people to navigate through a very complex tax code. And that will also cut taxes for about two-thirds uh, of the Minnesotans. So that is kind of the, the really big thing of this. But I want to talk about uh, the bill in more detail. And Mr. Chair, the most important thing for you, I know, is on the spreadsheet, and I'm not going to be going over the spreadsheet, but if you look at a number, it's in bold, Mr. Chair, it says we're actually to the good by $670,000 on the target. So I know that's your main concern. So let, me, so let me talk about the bill. Where does the revenue come from? I want to start out with that. It comes from three main areas. About 25% of the new revenue I'm talking about. And one thing to remember about all of this is that in the total budget that the House DFL has, uh, according to House research, 4% is new revenue, 
which means 96%, 96% of all the revenue we're talking about in all of these bills have already been approved by both parties, have already been signed off by both parties throughout the years, 96%. So we're really talking about 4% is what we're talking about. So where does the new revenue come in this bill? 25% comes from uh, the conformity that actually passed both the House and the Senate and went to the governor last year. So about 25% of that is those conformity dollars that everyone agreed to last year. 50% uh, of those dollars comes in in deemed repatriation and in the global intangible low tax income tax haven uh, worldwide approach we take uh, on the tax avoidance. That's about 50% of the new revenue. And then the other 25% of the new revenue comes from uh, a 3% tax on preferential rates. It's 3% it's on capital gains uh, over 500,000 value. Those are the really the three main areas of revenue. So. Where are the tax cut portions of the bill? So I want to talk about that. So uh, the standard deduction I mentioned before, about $164 million in the biennium uh, for uh, tax cuts uh, that will go to about two-thirds of Minnesotans around the state. Uh, $82 million in increased working, va working family credits. Uh, which will cut taxes for about 380,000 um, Minnesotan families around the state. And what we do here is uh, a couple of things. Is we, first of all, for a single person, we increase the phase out to about 21,000. So that at least a minimum wage, it doesn't phase out until at least a minimum wage. And then the federal government on their earned income credit, which is the same as a working family credit, has always recognized three children or more. Minnesota has never done that. So we now recognize three children or more in providing um, a uh, higher refund potential for that, which I think is around 2,500, and then expand the program generally over that. Uh, 20 million or 23 million actually will go into cutting taxes on Social Security benefits. And that will uh, benefit about 200,000 senior citizens. And if this provision was to become law, it would mean then that 56% of all senior citizens would not have any tax on any of their Social Security benefits. So that would be uh, pretty significant. There also is a second tier accommodation that will, that will benefit people roughly from about 38,000 population to 150, where we up the bracket a little bit on, on the bottom end, but take it down on the top end. So basically what happens is only that second tier from 38,000 to 150,000 would benefit uh, from that, and it wouldn't increase tax on anyone else. It's just you compress that a little bit. Um, there's also the angel investment credit, which is actually a credit that, has, that works. Uh, there was a report uh, that was done uh, by the Department of Revenue back a few years ago that looked at the angel investment credit for three years and said that it had created about $72 million of new investment that would have not been there but for the angel investment credit. Uh, so that will really help businesses, especially startup businesses. Also for small businesses, we've got the Section 179 full conforming. That's about $220 million of relief to farmers and small businesses so they can depreciate up to a million dollars uh, in the first year. Uh, also, on the property tax side, uh, there's $75 million of direct property tax relief. Uh, $45 million will go into Homestead Credit State Refund and Renters Credit. And by the way, the property tax portion of the bill uh, was under the, le the excellent leadership of, of Representative uh, Chair Loeffler. Uh, there's also local government aid, uh, 30 million, 30 and a half million of new local government aid in the cities and 30 and a half million new county program aid to counties, which bring them back to basically their 2002 levels. Uh, one part that is really important is uh, for farmers. Uh, there are, there's $30 million of property tax relief 
for, by increasing the ag to school credit on school building <coughs> bonds from 40% to 70%. Uh, that is um, uh, $30 million to farmers. And uh, the section 179 full conforming will also be very beneficial to farmers. There's also a representative poppy portion of the bill that helps clarify on trusts in that, that will help bring farmers more into homestead. And I don't know, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen, seen that video from Tom Berg, that 26 year old dairy farmer from Patton Island, Minnesota. It's about a six minute video. And it's heart wrenching if you watch it. And um, you've got this 26 year old farmer who takes a video of himself and he just had a fight with his dad over, uh, they're trying to buy some feed but they're gonna have to sell some cows to do that. And he just laments about the conditions on these dairy farms and talking about suicides. His dad who's about 60 years old and he's tearing up, talks about how the dad says, we have less now than when I started. And his mother called Land of Lakes to see if there could be any help. And they said, yeah, we, will, we, we could provide you a job. But he said, here's my mother who gets up at 4.30 in the morning and then goes to sleep at 10. When, when does she have time to do that? And so, you know, the income on dairy farms now is down to about 15,000, I think. And I know, uh, Chair Poppy and Representative Hamilton have some funding in, in one of the bills and others, but uh, this is something bipartisan we've worked, and Representative Draskowski and I, we've worked a lot on this farm ag credit, which is valuable. So anything we can do is really going to be value, but valuable. And then, of course, early on, we had all the barns that were collapsing and so forth, and most of those were dairy farms. It's, you know, it's prices. You know, there's not a lot we can necessarily do with that because it's a lot with prices. But we can help with some of these input costs on, on property taxes in the Section 179 and those type of things. Uh, so, members, um, I, I will say that there are 43 Republican provisions in the bill. And at 362 pages, that's one GOP provision for every 8.4 pages in the bill. <laughs> And now, if this was the Health and Human Services bill, that would equal like 130 or 140 uh, provisions because it's a little bit bigger. But we've, you know, one thing is, that, you know, and, and granted, people are not going to agree with everything in the bill. But what we're trying to do here is really, what can we do to maintain the future we have with some of the budget constraints we have, too? And so this, while providing those important investments, really targets, really prioritizes the working families and our senior citizens, our farmers, and our small businesses. And so uh, with that, um, I'll stop. And so thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, uh, Representative Marquardt. Any uh, questions on the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say for a tiny little bill, this does a lot of great stuff. Mm -hmm. Representative Marquardt, thank you. Right. And it's within its target, as you pointed out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that. Um, Representative Graffel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Marquardt, is it fair to say that this bill is what is used to pay for the increases in spending and other bills in this, uh, that have come before this committee? Absolutely. <laughs> it, Mr. Chair and Representative Graffalo, uh, it provides the spending that will allow the investments to move our state forward and provide a great future for our state. So, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, the Marquardt tax bill is defective, it's damaging, and it's dangerous. Uh, number one, it's defective because it operates from the wrong premise. It operates from the premise that the over $3 billion of resources that are available uh, for this biennium that were not available the last biennium are not enough. Uh, the reality is that word, enough, enough government spending these days, seems to be lost on the DFL. It seems to be that enough is like the boogeyman or the tooth fairy doesn't exist. It's a myth or a legend. That's why this bill is defective. Second of all is it's damaging. Once again, it raises taxes on businesses, raises taxes on individuals to finance an unsustainable level of growth in government spending. And third and finally, this bill is dangerous. We have an exceptionally volatile tax code in the state of Minnesota as a result of the 2013 tax increases that were signed into law exclusively by the Democrats. And this bill would add even additional, more volatility 
to our already unstable tax code. Mr. Chairman and members, uh, I don't worry about this bill becoming law. I'm confident that our colleagues in the other chamber are going to uh, bring some reasonableness to, to this. And Representative Marquardt, I wish you well in your conference discussions. But again, I would focus members on the fact that you cannot have government growing faster than the private sector economy. And introducing this level of volatility into our tax code, the corporate tax is an extremely volatile revenue source, relying even more on capital gains than we already do, relying on wealthy taxpayers at a time when over $400 million annually is leaving the state of Minnesota in taxable income. We can dispute why it's leaving, but it's happening right now. Uh, for those reasons, we do not want to be injecting this level of instability and growth and unsustainability into our tax code, and I would ask members to vote no. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further discussion? Seeing none then, uh, Representative Mark. Well, Representative Gruskowski, I didn't see your hand up. Uh, it just, it just, so it just popped up, in. Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Marquardt, for coming forward with your bill. Um, I concur with Representative Garofalo. Um, and the work you've done around agriculture, um, Chair Marquardt, I really appreciate um, that work. Um, the bill on the whole, though, uh, increases taxes, if I remember correctly, $1.2 or $1.3 billion on people who work and make this state go. Um, you know, the, the efforts around tax conformity, I think there's some really good parts you have in there going to adjusted gross income and some other things uh, that are similar to what we did in last year's tax bill. Uh, last year's tax bill, though, uh, went and turned around and reduced taxes on those groups of people who were uh, taxed by the move to um, tax conformity. This bill does that a little bit, uh, but not very much. It instead takes a lot of that money and redistributes it uh, to uh, uh, places, including people who don't pay taxes. And so, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, working family credit uh, should be renamed. We really should rename that to something else. I don't have the perfect name for it yet, uh, but this is giving uh, money from hardworking Minnesotans who are taxed out of their wits end um, and taxes them even harder and gives it to people who don't have tax liability and puts it in, puts that cash into their pocket instead of the people who it was taken from. And I, I find that to be uh, repulsive. And uh, we just see more and more of that when Democrats are in control here. And uh, I think Minnesotans need to wake up to what, um, what they got. This is what they got. Uh, Minnesotans, you, uh, you have now a majority in the Minnesota House that wants to take money from people who work and give it to people who don't have tax liability. Um, and it's, it's a horrible thing. Um, on top of that, it taxes the gajibers out of smokers. Um, if you are uh, uh, in, involved in wine shipments, uh, it taxes you for that. It increases the statewide property tax on, um, on businesses. Uh, it uh, has an increase in taxes uh, for the estate tax, so uh, dead people get taxed even more in this bill. Uh, we're going the wrong way on those items. Uh, Chair Marquardt, I do appreciate uh, the small uh, reduction in the tax on Social Security benefits, adding on to what we did last year, and that was small too. <laughs> and maybe this, this is very similar, uh, but that is a move in the right direction. Um, but many of the things that are called uh, by the majority here as tax cuts are not tax cuts, uh, but instead are simply uh, pandering to constituencies. And uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this bill uh, needs, to, uh, needs to die somewhere or at least uh, be, be uh, constituted into something uh, a lot different than it is here because this is going to be, um, I, yeah, dangerous is a good word, but um, this is going to be very uh, difficult not only on Minnesota's economy, but on its families and people who work, our work ethic, and the ability to, uh, to continue to be a, a state that uh, uh, we can be proud of because it's, uh, we're seeing a, uh, uh, a exodus of wealth from Minnesota. We're going to continue to uh, really expedite the pattern of exporting our wealth and importing poverty with this bill because it uh, punishes people who work hard and, and, and try to accumulate a little wealth in this state and instead takes that money and turns around and uh, works to attract more poverty by funding more programs uh, that attract people from other states 
here that don't uh, have the same work ethic as the people uh, oftentimes that we are chasing to Florida and other places. So uh, that's not a good sustainable uh, outlook on the future of our state. This uh, not only accentuates that, but builds on it and goes the wrong direction. We need to be uh, focusing on policy uh, that encourages work, uh, policy that rewards work, um, but this does uh, go in the opposite directions of both of those. So for those reasons, I'll be voting no on the bill uh, here and, uh, and on the floor. But again, thank you, Mr. Chair, for your thank work. You. And there are some elements to the bill I do like. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I um, had already recognized Representative Garofalo for the um, minority wrap-up, and I was about to recognize um, Representative Marquardt for any concluding comments, but I did revert back to Representative Draskowski. Um, so, uh, Representative Marquardt. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And first of all, the February forecast said we have a budget deficit in the next biennium. So there isn't all this money around. We have a budget deficit, and that's before you count inflation. Uh, we always hear about all the wealth and all the wealthy people leaving the state. We heard that back in 2013 when we raised the fourth tier or added a fourth tier. And back in 2013, there was about 60,000 people who filed taxes in the fourth tier. In 2017, in a recent report, it's gone up 20%. It's now 73,000 that are now in the fourth tier, an increase of over 20% from 2013 when we heard about everyone that was going to flee the state. And it was a 10% um, increase from last year. It was like 66,000 went up to 73,000. The forecast uh, that came out in February, the last two years, we've had positive domestic migration, about 7,000 one year, and 8,000 the next year. So, uh, you know, this high flight that you hear about is not occurring. Um, half of the revenue raised is through these tax havens. And if anyone around this table thinks it's fair that a corporation, and these are not necessarily corporations in Minnesota, in fact, most of them aren't, but they benefit from a good tax system. They benefit from a hardworking, well-trained workforce. They benefit from infrastructure. They benefit from our public safety. They should be paying their fair taxes. But what they do, and the federal government, uh, President Trump and the Republican-controlled Congress also realized this was a problem, and that's why they came up with global intangible low-tax income, otherwise known as guilty, they came up with that. Because what happens is you've got a domestic corporation, let me give you one example, that will transfer their uh, intellectual and tangible property, like trademarks, naming rights, patents, drug formulas, they will transfer them over to the Cayman Islands that have no taxes. And then they will buy those back. So the income goes to the Cayman Islands and the loss of income comes out of the domestic corporation. There was a survey done among small businesses. Seven out of 10, seven out of 10 said they thought this was unfair and hurt them on the competitive nature. So I don't think it's fair that a company can shelter billions of dollars in a tax haven that should be partly taxed in Minnesota. I don't think that's fair to another company that doesn't have a foreign corporation and can't do that. I don't think it's fair that all of us pay more in taxes because they can artificially, through gimmicks, it's legal, but I don't think it's right, can stash things over in a tax haven. When they do that, I don't think it's fair that we should struggle to find funding for education and for our nursing homes, for our public safety, when these foreign controlled corporations can stash billions of dollars. Um, in, the, in Bermuda, um, the total GDP in Bermuda is $6 billion, the total GDP. Uh, in 2014, businesses reported to the IRS that they had a total of $96 billion of profits in that country that had $6 billion of GDP. And so that's what the federal government is capturing. They know that is not activity there. That is purely sheltering profits 
over into that area without really having any business activity. And that's what Guilty is saying, is that this is not really um, foreign business activity. This is, should be domestic activity, and it should be taxed accordingly. That's what we do. And I will conclude with this, that this bill, again, is about building the future. And we just had the final four here over in Minneapolis. Virginia was able to go up and cut the nets down after they won the championship. The goal of this bill and the goal of this state should be that every child, no matter who they are or where they live, should be able to climb those steps of that ladder of life and be able to cut the nets down to show the achievement and victory that they have had in life. And this investment from this tax bill will do that. He's always so okay with that. Uh, so, Representative Martin uh, Martin uh, renews his motion that House File 2125, first engrossment as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. So uh, all those uh, in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. <laughs> motion carried. Thank you, Representative uh, Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And uh, with that, uh, we now have uh, Representative uh, Dean's bill up. Uh, or no, Representative Poppy, excuse me. We've got two more, Representative Poppy and Representative uh, Dean. Representative Poppy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move adoption of the Agriculture and Food Finance and Policy Division report for House File 1581. Motion is uh, before us. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Uh, Representative Poppy? And then I move that House File 1581, as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the motion is before us, and there are no amendments, so if you would explain the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, it was. Um, March 4th, 2019, when we passed House, House File 232 off the House floor unanimously, we all recognize that there's a need right now for rural mental health and support for our farmers. Uh, Representative Markor talked about the dairy farmer from Pine Island, and I, I honestly tell you, if you have not read that article in the Star Trib or if you've not watched that Facebook video, please do so because that just exemplifies where the need is right now in our state and where the hurt is. We have dairy farmers that are trying to figure out if they can sell cows to buy feed to be able to take care of the rest of their cows, if they need to um, reduce their herd, if they need to sell out. Many of them can't afford to do that because they just don't have the income coming in. The balance sheet is not working for them. We have other farmers right now, um, any of the crop farmers that are looking to have spring come at some point so that they can actually get in the field. We've got flooding that's been happening. We've got down power lines. We've got things that have um, cause them to not have electricity. So again, when you're trying to figure out how you're going to take care of your livestock or prepare for the spring and um, plant your crops, people are, are just in a world of hurt. So Mr. Chair, this bill, uh, 1581, is the bill um, actually as we did pass off House File 232 on the floor, um, it matches up um, with the same uh, information in this bill. It does increase the mental health provider. Right now we have one person who does that work throughout the state. It would allow the opportunity to add a second provider. It also would increase the capacity and service of the farm advocates that we have. They right now are stretched to their limit. We have people who have been doing this job for a number of years, um, but they are um, they're also hurting because they're hearing these stories every day. We also um, would increase farmer lender mediators and allow them to be able to provide um, greater service to the people um, who are facing um, many concerns in the agricultural sector. Um, in the Senate, um, they have not taken up the comparison bill for House File 232. They've not taken up the compatible bill that um, for House File 232. They've not uh, taken up any bill that addresses the rural mental health needs that our farmers are facing. And this bill is an attempt to try again and hope that uh, we have every opportunity to be able to bring forward mental health funding, mental health resources, provide any services that we can to help our struggling dairy farmers, and other farmers, all of the agricultural sector in the state of Minnesota. So with that, Mr. Chair, I would just um, ask for your support. Okay, the uh, motion is carried. Uh, Representative Poppy, 
Motion is before us. Any discussion? Seeing none. Representative Ariane. Mr. Chair, just very quickly, I want to thank you for this bill, Representative Poppy. <clears throat> a lot of folks don't know this, but back in the 80s, I worked with the Minnesota Council of Churches, and we had um, uh, quickly mobilized to uh, create a pastoral care statewide uh, network uh, precisely because the tragic uh, circumstances that are occurring right now were happening in the 80s with lots of family farmers all across the state just struggling struggling, and it led to uh, suicides. Uh, it led to incredible despair across the state. And um, and so, yeah, so I had the privilege to work with Ann Canton uh, at that time, who helped set up the advocates uh, uh, program. Uh, it reminds us that, uh, one, um, there are real people out there uh, that played a critical role um, as part of our community, as part of our economy, and that there are cycles of incredible hurt. Uh, that happened uh, because of the incredible uh, fluctuation in our agriculture um, uh, sector. So uh, vitally important work, and I commend you and look forward to supporting this in any way possible. Okay, any uh, discussion? Representative Poppy uh, renews her motion then that uh, uh, House File um, 1581 uh, be placed on the uh, general register. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chair, members. Now we will take uh, Representative Dean's uh, bill up. The, there he is. Um, and uh, this is House File uh, 1487, dealing with uh, elections. Uh, Representative Olson. Mr. Chair, I move that House File 1487, the first engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us. Uh, there are no amendments, so Representative Dean, would you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, members. Uh, this bill is the administration bill from the Secretary of State. It makes some updates and changes to provisions regarding elections. Um, that aren't significant. There's no fiscal note, but we're here in front of you as well. And, you know, to uh, head off Representative Garofalo at the pass, I don't believe this does anything to grow government. Uh, so these are some simple technical changes, and uh, I can outline a couple of them very quickly for you. Uh, some of the main things it does is it does um, address the issue of um, of uh, where a person maintains a residence and, and what that is. So it changes that, um, that language regarding <coughs> that particular issue. Uh, beyond that, it um, addresses some issues around prohibitions related to solicitations near polling places that apply only to voting hours. And part of that has to do with, we have some of our community facilities and things that are used for other types of events, so it, it limits it to that. Um, it, it changes some provisions around uh, manual counts on close elections and uh, makes some exceptions to overlapping municipal and school district jurisdictions when one of the jurisdictions has a question on the ballot. So those are a few of the things. Happy to answer any questions that other members may have. Just one uh, comment. Uh Ms. Conley uh, reminded me, uh, there is a fiscal note in the packet. A fiscal note was provided, and the fiscal note states that there is no cost. Yes. So just to clarify why that's in oh, I'm the sorry. members' packet. Yes, there was a fiscal note, but with no cost. So yeah. No so fiscal just, implications. Just so we're clear on that. Yep. So uh, any uh, discussion on the bill? Uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Dean, and there are a number of uh, strikeouts throughout the bill where you're removing the word resides and you're inputting the words maintains residence. And there's also an occurrence where um, you're changing residence to maintains residence and you're also changing resides to maintains residence. Why the change? Uh, Representative Dean. 
Mr. Chair and members, uh, the Secretary of State's office has said that there's always been a little bit of confusion around what that means to reside. And uh, it was added, maintains residence, to add clarification on that. And I, I do have uh, Sam Benowitz from uh, the Secretary of State's office if uh, you'd like to get more in detail about that. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Albright, would you Mr. like to Representative Dean, I, I would because I think, and from my perspective, I think it makes it even more ambiguous in terms of what that definition relates to. Yeah. No. Welcome to the uh, committee, and if you could identify yourself for the record. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Sam Bonowitz with the Office of the Secretary of State. Um, we changed reside to maintain residence because maintaining residence is defined in statute, and there's a category, there's a number of items that you kind of check the box to say if you maintain residence or not, um, whereas resides is not. So just clarifying that, especially for um, students who may be technically residing at college, um, but they maintain residence at their, in their home where they were raised. And, and Mr. Chair, uh, and what? to the testifier, so when you're, cha you're changing, in this case, my definition, and, and help me understand why yours is uh, the preferred. Resides means, in the definition of a college student, I understand that, but what would be the definitional difference for someone that maintains a residence in Minnesota, but also maintains a residence in Florida? So there's only one. Um, Go through the chair. Sorry, <laughs> chair, members of the committee. Um, so you can only maintain residence at one location for this. So you might reside in Florida temporarily, but you maintain your residence in Minnesota. Um, so then you vote in Minnesota. So, Mr. so Chair, snowboards. So you can only maintain one residence? Correct, for the purposes, um, chair, members of the committee, sorry. Um, for the purposes in this, um, in this bill, yes, for voting, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any uh, further discussion? And remember, this is uh, a policy bill that no longer has any fiscal impact. Representative Lebo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just, I think maybe part of the confusion um, is that it's not maintain a residence, it's maintain residence. But something the test fair said just made me, raised a little bit of a question for me about college students. Is this change of definition gonna change where people who currently, where some voters that currently vote in some places are gonna to have to change where they vote because of the change in the definition? Or is it just truly a clarification with no impact on current voters? Ms. Monowitz. Chair, members, this is just a clarification um, because we had some confusion with um, college students in particular who, main, who, who are residing at college temporarily, um, but they maintain residence in their home with their parents. Um, and wanted to make sure that they were within the law to vote um, in that residence, so. Perhaps I'll leave Any further uh, discussion? Uh, seeing none then, uh, Mr. Frey. Representative Wilson. Mr. Chair, I renew my motion that uh, House File 1487, the first engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the motion is uh, before us. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then all those <coughs> in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members. Before, thank you. Uh, we adjourn. Um, when we return uh, after the break, our first uh, meeting will be on the Wednesday after we return. And uh, I did mention to some of you during the rules meeting and some of the DFLers, but want to make sure everybody's aware. We uh, will begin meeting at 8 a.m. on those days, and um, we will be meeting in the Capitol, room 120. We've already reserved that uh, room. And uh, the reason that we're going to have an earlier start, uh, at this point in time, the House will be convening at 9 a.m., and uh, leadership has negotiated the uh, time that's necessary uh, with the minority party. <coughs> I'm uh, not sure if both parties are included, but at least the uh, majority minority party, uh, as to the amount of time that is needed uh, to, be to be debating the bills. And I think the uh, first day they were talking about 10 or 12 hours. So 
our choice is either to begin early in the morning or to convene late at night because we have some major bills that uh, are coming up. We're still working on what that agenda will be, but um, when we return, there's a high probability that probably one of them would be legacy and maybe LCCMR, but there are some other funding bills too that uh, we'll be coordinating with uh, the leadership about which bills they want to bring up what day on the House floor. So that will also drive our agenda to some degree. So uh, with that, just so people are aware, uh, the first meeting, 8 a.m. Wednesday, room 120. And with that, uh, everybody have a good break and meet you adjourned.